نحمده ونصلي على رسوله الكريم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم We begin with Allah's blessed name We praise him and we glorify him as he ought to be praised and glorified And we pray for peace and for blessings on all his noble messengers, including the last of them all, the blessed Prophet Muhammad sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam. As we greet you from here in uh, Nasrul Quran, the beautiful and large auditorium of Nasrul Quran in Putrajaya, the administrative capital of Malaysia. Kuala Lumpur is the commercial capital. <laughs> Put higher, the administrative capital of Malaysia. We greet you on this, the sixth day of the month of Muharram. In the year 1446, we are still in July 2024, in Dajjal's system of time. We greet you with assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and I am grateful to my learned brother, the chairman, Dr. Hikmatullah for his introduction, but more than that I congratulate those who chose the topic for today an Islamic eschatological view of changing realities in the global order. And I just learned it is Dr. Hikmatullah himself who chose the topic. And he, of course, is the son of my beloved brother, his father, uh, Murphy Babu from Singapore. And may Allah have mercy on the soul of his father. And uh, we are happy to be once again here in Nasrul Quran to address you today on this subject. Our happiness is because only Islamic eschatology can give an Islamic view on this topic. Only Islamic eschatology. And today's topic demonstrates that scholarship in Islamic eschatology requires not only a profound study of the Qur'an and a study of the Hadith to the extent that the Hadith is in harmony with the Qur'an. But the end time is a difficult time because there are potholes <laughs> and there are traps waiting for you and you must be able to recognize when a hadith is in conflict with the Quran otherwise you're going to be misguided and I will only have sympathy for you, for your defective and deficient scholarship. In addition to a study of the Quran and the Hadith, in order to specialize in Islamic eschatology, you need to study the philosophy of history. And that is going to be applied today. It is the, the, the enduring legacy of my teacher of blessed memory, Maulana Dr. Muhammad Fadlur Rahman Ansari Rahimahullah, that when I was a student at the Alimia Institute of Islamic Studies in Pakistan, 
an institute which was established because he understood that our classical institutions of Islamic learning, the Al-Azhar University, the university in Karaun, the Darul Ulum, were now deficient, were not producing scholars who were capable of responding to the challenge of the modern world. And since he could not change them, and I cannot change them, he established a new institution of Islamic learning with a new model of scholarship different from theirs. And so as a student, I had a class in the philosophy of history. Did you hear that? And I had a competent teacher with a PhD in philosophy teaching me the philosophy of history. And that is essential scholarship for Islamic eschatology. I also need to study political history and economic history and monetary history to be able to deal with today's topic. And no matter what we do, we cannot get the Darul Ulum to change because they hold the view that knowledge is a package, a box which is already sealed and all that the institution of Islamic learning has to do is to transfer that package from one generation to another. There is no need for any original thinking, no need for any critical thinking, no need to seek to extend the frontiers of knowledge. And so we live today, as this lecture will de to demonstrate, in an age in which there is a, mark my words, because there is a judgment day coming, a pathetic failure of the scholars of Islam to even understand the changing realities of the modern world, far less to respond to it. Who are those scholars I would love to have present today when Imran, a little student, is speaking in the presence of these great scholars who are masters of this topic? The first name I would choose is not a Muslim. <laughs> Not a Muslim. The first name I would choose would be a British historian. Yes, British. And a political thinker. And a student of international affairs who wrote that classic little book, which I advise you to read. Civilization on Trial by Arnold Toynbee. If he, were present, if he was present today, I would be delighted to deliver this subject, this topic today in his presence, because that's a master. I would choose another scholar, this time a Muslim, but a different kind of scholarship in Islam, not the Darul Ulum, no. I would choose Dr. Muhammad Iqbal, Dr. Muhammad Iqbal, and his book, which you should read, The Reconstruction of Religious Thought in Islam. If he was present, or oh, I would be delighted as a student to deliver this lecture in the presence of such luminaries, 
because this is not an easy topic. It requires a versatile scholarship in which you combine the Quran, the Hadith, the philosophy of history, the history of inter international affairs, political history, economic history, monetary history, and other subjects to handle the subject. Change an Islamic eschatological view of changing realities in the global order. So thank you, Dr. Hikmat, for having chosen this challenging topic for today. And we are happy to be here in this large auditorium in Putrajaya on this the sixth day of the month of Muharram, 1446, to lecture on this topic. And our first comment is that, we, is that we now live in an age of momentous change taking place in the world order. What do we mean by world order? We mean power. When power dominates in the world and when power shapes and reshapes the relationship between states in the world, you have a world order. And we now live in an age which is, we, which is witnessing momentous change in a world order which has been dominated for the last few centuries by modern Western civilization. The Quran has declared in Surah Al-Nahl, and this is a pivotally important verse for the student of international affairs. بعد أوز بالله من الشيطان الرجيم ونزلنا عليك الكتاب تبيانا لكل شيء وهدى ورحمة وبشرى للمسلمين and we have sent down to you يعني O Muhammad صلى الله تعالى عليه وسلم the kitab يعني the Quran so that this book might explain all things. And hence this book must explain the phenomenon of modern Western civilization appearing on the stage of the world suddenly mysteriously and taking control of power in the world in a manner which was unique and unprecedented in human history, establishing its dominance over all of mankind. More than that, not just a display of Power, but more than that. Bringing with power a new civilization, a new way of life, different from the one which came from Allah. The one which came from Allah was one which told us that the sun rises from the east. And this one appears with a sun rising from the west. 
and therefore posing the mother of all challenges to the religious way of life and to truth which has come from the Quran. There's never been anything like this before in history with the emergence of this world order that came from modern Western civilization. If the Quran does not explain the phenomenon of modern Western civilization, then this statement in the Quran would be false that the Qur'an explains all things, tibian and likudli shayim. And hence, it should be clear to our audience here in Putrajaya and to all those around the world who will listen to this lecture, including the endless critics that I have. I don't think any scholar of Islam has the record that I have with more critics. The Quran must explain the phenomenon of modern Western civilization. Since the Quran says that it explains all things Tibian and Likulli Shaykh. And we have lived with that world order for almost 300 years, although some would add nine. Was that Lutisa? Some would add nine. And now, this godless world order because it is an essentially pagan civilization which does not believe in a hereafter that there is a life beyond the grave that there are angels you think the west believes in angels that there is a judgment day. You think Joe Biden believes that there is a judgment day? That there is punishment in Jahannam or hell and there is reward in heaven. You think the presidents of the United States believe in that or the French or the British? No. <laughs> they say we are a secular civilization and when they use the word secular they mean we've taken God and put him outside the house and we are now in control of the house we take charge we define what is truth and we will change truth whenever we choose to change it and at this time, truth is in the, it's called the rainbow flag of the feminist revolution. I don't know what term, it's something like LBGT, XYZ, whatever it is. The rainbow flag of this feminist revolution. Truth today is in the legislation that they enact that a man can marry another man and get a marriage certificate. I don't know what tomorrow's truth is going to be, uh, but this is a godless civilization with an ever-changing and ever-shifting conception of truth. And this godless civilization with power unprecedented in human history was able to take control of power in the world and to change the world 
and to constantly change the world as the world has never been changed before. And even as we speak, they're still changing the world. How do we explain it? That's another part of the topic. But the good news is that we now live from an Islamic eschatological viewpoint. We recognize we now live at a momentous point in history when modern Western civilization is a receding force in history. The modern West today is represented by the United States of America. And American dominance over the rest of mankind has been known as Pax Americana. But Pax Americana is receding, riding out into the sunset. It is in a state of decline. And we knew this, Islamic eschatology. We said this 20, 25 years ago. That's right. Only Islamic eschatology could have done it. That Pax Americana is on its way out. And Pax Americana is built on the US dollar. And the US dollar is flying high. We said this 25 years ago. Read my book, which is outside Jerusalem in the Quran, and we have a translation in Bahasa. But I don't know why. In Bahasa, you always repeat a word, orang, orang. So the translation in Bahasa is twice the size in English. <laughs> Read my book, Jerusalem in the Quran, and you see the proof. This book was written 20 something years ago. And in that book, we said, the time for the US dollar is coming to an end. And the time of Pax Americana is coming to an end. How could we say that? Because of Islamic eschatology, which is not taught in your Darululum. And not only is the world order changing, and Pax Americana is declining. But something more mysterious is taking place. That coinciding with this change is the ominous possibility that what is to replace Pax Americana, for which Pax Americana was created in the first place, and before that Pax Britannica was created, what is to replace, what is to come, is worse than Pax Americana. We said it, 25 years ago that our view is that there is a Pax Judaica which is coming. Our view is that not only did they wage a jihad, this is our term, their term is not jihad, their term is crusade. But the two mean the same. That they wage the crusades for this. Back to the acre. They conquered Jerusalem in 1917 for this. Back to the acre. 
They allowed the Jews to return to the Holy Land to reclaim it as their own. For this, back to the Ekrah, they allowed the state of Israel to be restored in the Holy Land 2,000 years after Allah had destroyed Holy Israel. Why? For this, Pax Judaica. And now Israel is poised to seek to replace the United States of America as the next ruling state in the world. This is Islamic eschatology, eschatology at work. And it is time for Russia and for China to pay attention to this topic. If the Quran explains all things, Tibian and the Holy Shay, then where is the explanation in the Quran which explains the return of the Jews to Jerusalem to reclaim it as their own 2,000 years after Allah had expelled them and had banned their return to Jerusalem. Show me the explanation in the Quran. If this Quran explains all things, then this Quran must explain not only the return of the Jews to the Holy Land to reclaim it as their own, but also the establishment of a state of Israel in the Holy Land and the rise of that Israel to today's Israel, which is defying the whole world in Gaza, defying even the President of the United States of America, defying the United Nations Security Council, defying world opinion, and proceeding helter-skelter on perpetrating what tomorrow would be recognized perhaps as a genocide of the Palestinian people in Gaza. Where is the explanation in the Quran? And if you cannot find the explanation in the Quran, then we say respectfully so, step aside and let us explain. But instead, you banned me from lecturing in your masajid. Instead of allowing me to teach, you banned me from lecturing in your masajid in Malaysia. But let me tell them, those scholars who sit in judgment over me, the truth will prevail regardless of what you do. And so now then, we are in momentous change in the world order. As I speak, as a Pax Judaica seeks to replace a Pax Americana, nothing is more momentous than that in the changing world order. But in the same way that a Pax Americana could not replace Pax Britannica without two great wars, the First World War and the Second World War, which were joined together really. So too, the movement from Pax Americana to a Pax Judaica is not possible without the Malhama, without what in Christian eschatology is referred to 
is Armageddon. Nuclear war. If there is such a war coming, which is an event that will be unique in all of human history, it must be in the Quran. It must be in the Hadith. And if you cannot find it, and you cannot understand it and explain it, then it is time for you to step aside and allow others to do what you cannot do. And I am thankful in my old age, by the moon I am now 84, Haji Awaluddin, who looks younger than me, is a few months older than me, but he eats a lot of Logan, so he looks young. <laughs> And uh, I'm happy in my old age that now, thanks to the internet, and that the fact in my old age I still keep on traveling from country to country, that we have been planting seeds. And alhamdulillah, a new generation of scholars of Islam is emerging. And these are young men, and some of them are young women with backbones made of steel, not recycled paper. So you can't control them, whether you're government or you're the armed forces. You cannot silence them, not this new generation of scholars of Islam. When is that great war likely to take place? Everybody asked me the question. I said, listen, when I know the day and I know the time, I'll let you know. <laughs> yes, I'll let you know. <laughs> but this time, I don't know the day and I don't know the time. Speaking honestly, I don't know the day, I don't know the time. What is likely to trigger the Great War? We shall bring about a dramatic change in the world order, instantaneously. Russian President Vladimir Putin has said, Russia can destroy the whole of the United States of America in half an hour. That is Russia's military power today. So the Great War is not likely to last more than a few hours. <laughs> That's all. And at the end of a few hours, the world will change. But the Russian armed forces, they don't want the Great War. This is not in 2024, like 1914. If you do your homework, and if you study history, political history and military, military history, if you want to be a scholar of Islamic eschatology, then you will know that at 1914, they had already prepared for the war. They had a government in France that they had put in place by means which are very devious to prepare for that great war. They had enacted a tripartite Tri tripartite alliance. Uh, there's another word to describe it. Uh, the alliance of Britain and France and Russia. They embraced Russia with a venomous embrace <laughs> in an alliance by 1907 or 8 to prepare for the Great War. And all that they needed was the matchstick.
to start the fire. But this is different today. The Russian armed forces don't want a nuclear war. The American armed forces don't want a nuclear war. NATO does not want a nuclear war. They want conventional war, yes, but not nuclear war. China does not want nuclear war. These are the major actors in the world order today. So who wants a nuclear war? Who wants the Malhama? Who wants Armageddon? It's not a secret that I'm telling you. It's public knowledge. And they're going to regret bitterly, bitterly, bitterly after the war. Bitterly, their involvement. It is the Israeli Mossad. They will listen to this lecture. The Mossad will listen to this lecture. They are the ones who want the nuclear war. And they will provoke it with an act of deception. That's their mod modus vivendi. That's their model. That's their trademark. The Mossad. Listen. By way of deception to deceive people. So a false flag act of terrorism, where would it take place? I don't know. How would it take place? I don't know. But the president of Serbia, Serbia's capital is Belgrade. He said about a week ago, he has knowledge I don't have. He says, I expect the great war in the next three months. Whatever is going to be that will trigger off the great war, what we know is that great war is coming and it's coming soon. And it will be a war unlike anything else in human history. Most of mankind will die in that war. And that war will be fought over a mountain of gold. So the, the war in Ukraine is only proxy. <laughs> It's only a proxy war. They're using Ukraine as a guinea pig. The real reason for the war was prophesied by Nabi Muhammad, alayhi salatu wasalam, and that is the value of Islamic eschatology. When he prophesied, there will be a great war for a mountain of gold and 99 out of every 100 who fight in that war would be killed. And so I ask the question, from Putrajaya in Malaysia on this the sixth day of the month of Muharram in this new year of 1446, where is the world of Islamic scholarship at this moment in time when the great war is around the corner? Where are the scholars of Islam? What do we have to do to wake them up for them to start to speak on this subject? Do we have to give them durian? <laughs> the Israeli Mossad wants the war on behalf of the state of Israel. And the Israeli Mossad is famous for its dirty tricks. 
the Minister of Defense of the State of Israel made history a few days ago. He is a member of the cabinet led by the Prime Minister Netanyahu. And the Minister of Defense in Israel is now calling for a commission of inquiry into the events of last October when the Islamic resistance who call themselves Hamas successfully launched an attack on Israel. So successful that they were able to capture I don't know, two, three hundred hostages or prisoners of war. The reason why the Minister of Defense is calling for that commission of inquiry is because he now suspects what I also suspected since October. I said it was the Israeli Mossad involved. And they were the ones who facilitated the transfer of weapons from the United States to Ukraine, from NATO to Ukraine. And these weapons, some of them were being siphoned off secretly and allowed a passage to reach Gaza. And Hamas did not know <laughs> that they were being deceived. And the Mossad was allowing this stockpile of sophisticated weapons to reach Gaza because the Mossad wanted the war that took place in October so that the plan could then unfold, which is now unfolding. The same thing happened in 9-11 that the CIA and the Mossad were the ones who planned and executed 9-11 in order that the Western world could then unfold its plan of endless wars on the world of Islam. If that commission of inquiry is allowed to be established, goodbye, Netanyahu. <laughs> because that commission of inquiry will confirm what the Minister of Defense suspects. In fact, I think he knows it. And what I have also said, that what happened on October 7th last year cannot be explained without the involvement of the Israeli Mossad. And maybe 25 years ago, I made a mistake. I said that Saudi Arabia and Israel were sisters. No, I was wrong. 25 years ago, they were only cousins. Now they are sisters. So I won't be surprised that Saudi Arabia was up to its neck in the illicit secret transfer of weapons to Gaza. In the same way that the Mossad played this dirty role, which caused the Israeli government to preside over the death of more than a thousand Israeli citizens. So too the Mossad can be involved in provoking the nuclear war that is coming. I want to now confirm with you what you already know, that Israel wants the nuclear war because Israel is confident that a nuclear war will destroy all rivals to power. And a post-nuclear war world would be a world in which Israel can step forward to take control of power in the world.
That's why Israel wants the nuclear war.